Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE conversation here in the Palo Alto CUBE studios. I'm John Furrier, the co-host of the CUBE, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media and the CUBE. We're here with Alan Cohen, CUBE alumni, uh, joining us today for a special segment on the future of technology and the impact to society. Always good to get Alan's commentary. He's the chief commercial officer for Lumio, industry veteran, uh, has been, been through many ways of innovation and now more than ever, this next wave of technology and, and the democratization of the global world is upon us. And we're seeing signals out there like cryptocurrency and blockchain Bitcoin to the, the disruption of, of industries from media and entertainment, biotech among others. Technology is not just a corner industry, it's now pervasive and it's having some significant impact and you're seeing that in the news, whether it's Facebook trying to figure out who they are from a data standpoint to across the board, every company. Alan, great to see you. Always great to be here. I always feel like I, I, don't, I can't tell whether I'm, you know, at the big desk at, at um, ESPN or I've got the guest chair at CNBC. Yeah. But that's what it's like being on the Cube. Great to have you on, extracting the signal noise. There's a ton yeah. of noise out there. But one of the things, the most important stories that we're tracking is this, uh, that's becoming very obvious, and you're seeing it everywhere, from Me Too to um, all aspects of technology, is the impact of technology to people and society. Okay, you're seeing the election. We all right. know what that is. That's now front and center in the big global conversation. You know, the Russians' role of hacking, the weaponizing of data. Facebook's taking huge brand hits on that. Yep. Two emerging startups in the, in the startup game that we're used to in, in Silicon Valley is changing. Just the dynamics. I mean, cryptocurrency, you know, raises billions of dollars, but yet <laughs> something like 10, 20% of it's been hacked and stolen. So yeah. it's a really wild west kind of environment. Well, it, it's, it's a very different environment. So like, John, you and I have been in the technology industry, certainly for a whole bunch of lines of, under our eyes over the years, <laughs> you know, have gone there. You know, my, my friend Tom Friedman has this phrase that he says, everybody's connected and nobody's in control. So the difference is that, as you just said, the tech industry is not a separate industry. The tech industry is in every product and service. Like cryptocurrencies, like the concept that then money is just code. Um, you know, our products and services are just code. It raises a couple of really core issues. Like, you know, for us in the security point of view, if I don't trust people with the products they're selling me, right? I feel like mm -hmm. they're going to be hacked, uh, including my personal data, right? So your product now includes my personal information. Uh, that's a real problem because that could actually melt down commerce in yeah. a real way. You know, obviously the election is if I don't trust the social systems yeah. around it. So I think we're all, and I, I'd like to say, we're all this little kind of like iRobot moment. And if you remember iRobot, it's like people build all these robots to serve humankind, and then one day the robots wake up and they go, we have our own point of view on how things are going to work, and they take over. And I think whether it's the debate about AI, yeah. whether cryptocurrency is good or bad, or more importantly, the products and services I use, which are now all mm -hmm. digitally connected to me, whether I trust them or not, is an issue that I think everyone in our industry has to take a step back, because without that trust, a lot of these systems are going to yeah. stop growing. Chaos is an opportunity, I think it's been quoted many times. You sound like of, Jeff Goldblum <laughs> in like Jurassic Park. Yeah. <laughs> it's an, so chaos is upon us, but this is an opportunity. The winds are shifting, and that's an opportunity yeah. for entrepreneurs. But the technology industry has to start working for us, but we got to be mindful of these blind spots, and the blind spots are, technology for good, not necessarily just for profits. So right. that also is a big story right now. And we see things like AI for good, Intel's been doing a lot of work on that area. And you see startups dedicated to societal impact. And then the young millennials, you see the demographic shift where they want to work on stuff that em empowers people and changes society. So a whole kind of new generation revolution uh, a kind of hippie moment, if you look at the 60s, what the 60s were, right? Well, there's people yeah. out in the street protesting, right? There were a couple of million women out in the street this weekend, right? So we are in that kind of moment again. Yeah. People are not happy with things. And I believe this yeah. is a signal of a renaissance, a change, a sea change at an enormous level. So I want to get your thoughts on this. The, as technology goes out in mainstream, you certainly from a security standpoint, your business, Illumio, is in that now where um, there's not a lot of control. There's like, mm -hmm. you were mentioning before we came on that you know, all the spend's happening, but <laughs> no one has more than 4% market share. Yeah. These are dynamics, and this is not just within one vertical. What's your take on this? How do you view this sea change that's upon us, this tech revolution? Well, you know, think about it, like, so you and I grew up in the era where 
client server took over from mainframe, right? So remember there was this big company called IBM, they owned a lot of the industry, and then it blew up uh, for client server, and then there were thousands of companies, and it consolidated its way down. But when those thousands of new companies, like you didn't know what was going to be Apollo and what was going to be Oracle, right? Like you didn't know how the, that was going to work out. There was a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty. And I think now we're seeing this on a scale like that's 10x of, the, of this that um, there's so much innovation and there's so much connectedness going on very rapidly, uh, but no one is in, is in control. You know, in the security market, mm -hmm. you know, what's happening in our world is like, oh, people said, okay, I have to reestablish control over my data. I've yeah. lost that control. And I've lost it for good reasons, meaning I've evolved to the cloud, I've evolved to the app economy, I've done all of these things, and I've lost it for bad reasons, because yeah. like, like, I'm not really running my data center the way I should. So we're in the beginning of a movement of people kind of reasserting that control. But it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle yeah. because the world itself is so much more dynamic yeah. and more more distributed. It's interesting, I've been studying communities and online communities for over a decade in terms of dynamics. You know, from an infrastructure level, yeah. how packets move to human interaction. And it's interesting, you mentioned that we're all connected and no one's in control, but you now see a groundswell of organic self-forming networks where yeah. communities are starting to work together. And it kind of, you kind of think about the analog world when we <laughs> grew up without computers and networks, you kind of knew everyone, you knew your neighbor, uh, you knew who the town loony was, you kind of knew yeah. things and people you know, watch each other's kids and parents sat from the porch, let the kids play. Uh, There's a way, a way that I grew up, it was still chaotic but yet somewhat controlled by the group. So I got to ask you, we, when you see things like cryptocurrency, uh, things like KYC, know your customer, yeah. Anti-money laundering, which is, you know, these are policy-based things. But we're in a world now where, you know, people don't know who their neighbors are. Yeah. So you're starting to see a dynamic where people are Put the phone asserting down. themselves <laughs> to know their neighbor, to well, know their customer, to have a connected tissue with context. And so your trust and reputation becomes super important. I think people are, re so like, every time there's a shift in technology, there's scary stuff and there's the fuddy-duddy moment where people saying, oh, we can't use that, or I don't know that, and you know, clearly we're in this kind of new Cambrian explosion yeah. of this cloud, mobile, blah, blah, blah type of computing thing, <laughs> and uh, blah, blah, blah is always a good intersection yeah. when you don't have a term. Um, and then things form around it, just as you said, so if you think about 25 years ago, right, people created the well and there was a community, right, at first bulletin boards, and like now we have Facebook, right, and you know, you, you go through a couple of generations, and for a while things feel out of control and then it reforms. I personally am an optimist. I mean, ultimately I believe in the inherent goodness of people, um, that, but the inherent goodness leaves you open and then you know, mm -hmm. can be manipulated, and people figure these things out. So, you know, whether it's cryptocurrency or AI, they are really exciting technologies that don't have any yeah. ground rules, yeah. right? And what's going to happen, I believe, is that people are going to reestablish ground rules. They're going to figure out some of the core issues. And some of these things may make it, and some of these things may not make mm -hmm. it. Like cryptocurrency, like I don't know whether it makes it or not, but certainly the blockchain is a technology we're going to be incorporating in what we do. And maybe the blockchain replaces VPNs and mm -hmm. last generation's way of protecting zeros and ones. Um, you know, if AI is figuring out how to read an MRI in five minutes, you know, it's it's a good thing, and if the MRI, and if the AI is teaching you how to exclude old yeah. folks from me finding jobs, it's a bad thing, yeah. right? So I think as technology forms, like right, there's always Spectre and 007, yeah. right? Yeah. There's always good and bad sides, and you know, I think you know if you. I'm with it, you on that. Yeah. I think value shifts. I think yeah. ultimately it's like however you want to look at it, will shift to something. Uh, value activity will be somewhere else. Um, behind me in the bookshelf is uh, a book called The World Is Flat, and you're quoted in it um, a lot. Um, as a futurist, because you have inherently that kind of view. Well, that's not what you do for a living, but you, you, you kind of an optimist. Marketing futurist. futurist, kind of same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Thomas Friedman, the book, that was a great book, and at that time, yeah. it was um, game changing. If you take that premise into today, where we are living in a flat yeah. world, and look at cryptocurrency, and then overlay the geopolitical landscape. I mean, I just can't see why the Federal Reserve wouldn't rein in this cryptocurrency because if Japan's going to control much of or China, it's going to be some interesting conversations. I mean, I would be like all over that if I well, was I, the, I, I uh, think the people, Federal Reserve. I think, you know, it's, look, cryptocurrency is really interesting and I think people are a little over-rotated. So if you look at the amount of GDP that's invested in cryptocurrency, it's like, I don't know, there might have been, 
you know, 20 years ago, the same amount invested in Beanie Babies, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, things show up for a while and the question is, is it sustainable over time? Now, I'm trained as an economist, you and I have had this conversation, so I don't know how you have a series of monetary without kind of governmental backing. Mm -hmm. I, ju I just don't understand. Yeah. But I do understand that people find all kinds of interesting ways to trade, yeah. Yeah. and if it's an exchange, like, I mean, what's the difference between gold and cryptocurrency? Somebody yeah. have ascribed the value to something that really has no efficacy outside of its usage. Yeah, I mean, you can put a, you can make a filling or a bracelet out of gold, but it doesn't really mean <laughs> anything except people agree to a unit of value. Well, you know, so if people do that with cryptocurrency, it does have the ability to become a real currency. Well, I want to pick your perspective on this. Yeah. Being an economist, this is the hottest area of cryptocurrency. It's also known as token economics. Is yeah. is a concept. Token and, economics. And and you know that's uh, an area that you know the cube. Uh, with KubeCoin is experimenting yeah. with uh, tokens. Tokens technically are used for things and mobile and whatnot, but having a token as a utility um, in a network is kind of the whole concept. So the big trend that we're seeing, and no one's really talked about this yet, is instead of having a CTO, Chief Technology Officer, they're looking for a, a CEO, a Chief Economist Officer. Yeah. Because what you're seeing with the MVP economy we're living in and this gamification which became growth hack, which didn't really help users, the notion of decentralized applications and uh, token economics can open the door for some innovation around value. And well, ec it's an yeah. economic problem. How do you f have a fiscal policy of your token? There's a monetary policy. What's it tied to? A product and a technology. Right. So you now have a, now a new twisted intertwined mechanism. Well, you have it as part of this explosion, right? So we're at a period of time, it feels like there's a great amount of uncertainty because everything's you, the, you know, there's a lot of different forces and not everybody's in control of them. And you know, it's interesting, you know, Google has this architecture they call Beyond Core, where with the concept is like, networks are not trusted, so I will just put my trust in the device. Duo Security is a great example of a company that's built a technology, a security technology around it, which is completely antithetical to everything we know about networks and security. They mm -hmm. say everything's the internet, I'll just protect the device that it's on, it's a kind of perfect architecture for a world like where nobody's in charge, so just isolate you know, those, by the way, so what is a device? It's a token too, mm -hmm. right? it's a person. Your iPhone's yeah. your personal token. Yeah. So, um, and, and then over time, systems will form, form around it. So, I think we just have to, we yeah. always have to learn how to function in a different yeah. type of economy, right? I mean, democracy was a new economy 250 yeah. years ago that kind of screwed around with most of the world, and a lot of people didn't think it would make it. In fact, we went through two World War Wars that it was a little on the edge whether democracy yeah. was going to make it, and it yeah. seems to have done okay. Like, it was pretty good IPO to buy into, yeah. right? You know, yeah. 1776, <laughs> and, but it's always got yeah. risks and struggles with it. Um, I think, if, you know, ultimately it comes together, it's a, whether a large group of people can find a way to mm -hmm. function socially, economically, and with their personal yeah. safety you bring in up these systems. You bring up a great point, yeah. so I want to go to the next level in this conversation, which is around. Then you got the wrong guy if you're going to the next level, because I just yeah. tapped out. No, yeah. no, no, we'll get you there. <laughs> <laughs> it's my job to get you there. Um, the question is that everyone always wants to look at, whether it's someone looking at the industry or actors inside the industries across yeah. the board, mainly the tech, we'll talk about tech, is the question of are we innovating? And you brought up some interesting nuances what, and that we talked about with token economics. I mean, Steve Jobs has the classic, uh, had the classic presentation where he had street signs, technology yep. meets liberal arts. That's a mental image that people who know Steve Jobs know Apple was a key positioning point for Apple at that time, which was let's make computers and technology connect with society, liberal arts. Okay, but what we were just talking about is the business impact of technology, the economics. <laughs> and, and that's just not like just some hand waving making technology yeah. integrate with business, you're in the security business, there are some gamification technology, gamification, that's business, right. built into the products. So the question is, if we have a, the, 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 the integration of business, technology, economics, policy, society, rolling into the product definitions of innovation, does that change the lens uh, and the aperture of what innovation is? Well, I think it does, right? You know, you know, the IT industry is somewhere between three and four trillion dollars, depending on how it counts it. It grows pretty slowly. It grows by a low single digit. And that tells me as a composite, like, is that that slow growth is a structural signal about how consumers of technology think in a macro sense. On a micro sense, things shift very rapidly. 
right? New platforms show up, new applications show up, all kinds of things show up. What I don't think we have done yet, to your point, is in this new integrated world, the role of technology is not just technology anymore. I don't think, yeah. you know, you said you need chief economic officer. What about a chief political officer? What about a chief social officer? How many heads of HR make decisions about the insertion of systems into their business? And that's what this kind of iRobot concept is yeah. in my mind, which is that, you know, we are ceding control of things that used to be done by human yeah. beings to systems. Yeah. And when you cede control, the social mores, the political mores, the cultural mores, and the human emotional mores yeah. have to move with it. We don't tend to think about things like that. Yeah. We're like, uh, I win and my competitors lose. Like technology used to be much more of a zero sum, my tech's better than yours. Mm -hmm. But the question is not just is my tech better than yours, is my customer better off in their industry for the consumption mm -hmm. of my technology, of inserting it into the, their offering or their service. And I, you know what, I, that is probably going to be the next area of study. The, the other thing that's very important, and look, you know, whether, um, I don't know if you've read Peter Thiel's books, Zero to One, the nature of competition in technology used to feel like a flat playing field. And now the other thing that's rising is do you have super winners? Mm -hmm. And then what is the power of the super winners? So you mentioned whether it's Facebook or Google or mm -hmm. Amazon or, you know, or Microsoft, you know, uh, uh, the FANG companies, right? Um, their roles are so much more significant now mm -hmm. than the four horsemen of the NASDAQ were in yeah. 2000 when you had Intel and Cisco yeah. and Oracle and Sun. So, so you're seeing that game. now, so it's a good point. So you're reinforcing yeah. kind of this notion that the super, the super players, if you will, are having an impact. You mentioned the confluence of these new sectors, you know, government, policy, social, are new areas. Yeah. So the question is, this sounds like a strategic imperative for the industry, and, and we're early, so it does not like there's a silver bullet, or is there? Yeah. Um, doesn't sound like there, so to me that's, not really in place yet, I mean. Oh no, we are, we, we're not even an alpha. Like, well, we have demo code for the new economy. <laughs> like, and we're trying to get the new model funded. <laughs> That's the like, demo version, not the real version. Yeah, it's a classic this joke. This is not the alpha or the beta version that like you're going to go launch it. So if people think they're launching yeah, it, yeah. I think it's a little preliminary. And, you know, it's not just financial yeah. investment, it's like, do I buy in? I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that's really interesting. I've been visiting a bunch of our customers lately, and the biggest change, I'd say, in the last two years is they now have to prove to their customers they're going to be good custodians of their data. Think about that. Like, you go to any digital commerce you do, any website you use, mm -hmm. and you give them basically the ticket to the Furrier family privacy. <laughs> you do. Um, but you don't spend a lot of time questioning whether they're really going to protect your data. That has changed. Yeah. And it's really changing in B2B and, and in government organizations. So the role of data obviously is regulation, GDPR in Europe, but this is a whole new dynamic. Well, and, but, but, and it's not just my data because I'm worried about my credit card getting hacked, I'm worried about my identity. Like, am I going to show up as a meme in some social media feed that's substituted for the news? Yeah. Right, and you know, so, you know, I don't want to use the FN word, right? But you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, so it is a really brave new world. It's yeah. like, in it's, it's like a hyper democracy and a hyper risky state at yeah. the same time. So we're living in an area yeah. of massive pioneering new grounds. This is new territory, so yeah. there's a lot of strategic imperatives that are yet not defined. So now let's take it to how people compete. And we were talking before we came on camera. You mentioned the word we're in an MVP economy, yeah. minimum viable product. Um, concept, and you're seeing that being a standard operating procedure for essentially de-risking this challenge, right? The old way of, you know, build it, ship it, will it work? Uh, and we're seeing the impact from Hollywood to big tech companies to every industry. Well, you've got a coffee mug for a company that does both, <laughs> right? Amazon does MVP in entertainment, like we'll create one pilot and see if it goes, as opposed to ordering a season for $17 million to, hey, let's try this feature and put it out on AWS. And what's interesting is, I don't think we've completely tilted, but the question is, will buyers of technology, of entertainment products, of any product, start to saying, I'll try it. 
right? So, you know, like, you, you look, I've, I've done four startups, and I always know there's somebody I can go to get and try my early product. There are people that just have an appetite, right? Jeffrey Moore's yeah. early adopter, yeah. all the way to the left of they'll the They'll buy chasm. anything new. They'll, they'll try it, they're interested, they have the time, the resources, or they're just intellectually curious. And, but it was always a very small group of people in the IT industry. What I think that the MVP economy is starting to do is, look, I quick, I kickstarted my wallet. I don't know if I'm the only person who bought that skinny little wallet on mm -hmm. Kickstarter. It doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. It had a peel. So what's the impact to the MVP economy? Is it going to change the competitive landscape, like Peter Thiel was suggesting? Yeah. Does it change the economics? Does it change the makeup of the team? All of the above. What's your thoughts on how this is going to impact? Certainly the incumbents will seem to be impacted if or not. Will well, they? I, think, I think two things happen. One, it attacks the structural way markets work. Right, you know, if you think, if you go back to classical economics, right, land, labor, and capital, mm -hmm. and the people who own those assets now, you add information as a fourth. Yeah. If those guys were around now, they would say that would be the fourth uh, core asset. Uh, production, uh, I'm sorry, means of production is the term. Um, the people who can dominate that would dominate a market. Now that that's flattened out, you know, I think it pushes against the traditional structures and it allows new giants to kind of show mm -hmm. up overnight, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the e-commerce market is rife with companies that have, like look at Stitch Fix, right? I mean, company driven by AI, fashions, tries to figure out what you like, sends it to you every month, just had a monster IPO, reinvented, by the way, the Spiegel catalog, except <laughs> like with a personal <laughs> assistant, and it, you know has changed that in just a yeah. short number of years. So I think two things happen. One is you'll get new, new potential giants, but certainly new players in the market quickly. Two, it will force a change in the business model Mm -hmm. of every company, right? If you're in a mm -hmm. cab in any city in the world, I'm not saying whether the app works mm -hmm. or not, Uber and Lyft has forced every cab company to show you, here's the app to call the cab. They haven't quite caught up to the rest of the yeah. experience. Yeah. So what I think happens is ultimately the larger players in an industry have to accommodate that model. For people like me, uh, people who build companies or large technology companies, we may have to start thinking about MVPing of features yeah early on working with a small group, which yeah. is a little what the beta process is, but yeah. now think about it as a commercial process. Yeah. Nobody does it, but I bet you a lot of people will be doing it in five years. I want to get your take on that approach, because you're talking about a really disrupted, reimagining industry. Yeah. The Spiegel catalog now becomes digital with, with technology. So the role of technology uh, in business, we kind of talked about the intertwine of that, and mm -hmm. it's nuanced, it's going to get better, in my opinion. But specifically, the IT, the information technology industry, is being disrupted. It used to be like a department. You know, the IT department and we'll give you your yeah. phone and your desk on your, uh, your PC and your desk or whatever. Now that's being shattered and everyone that's participating in that IT industry is evolving. Well, well, ever look, look, What's it, your take on the IT industry's disruption? Well look, it started 20 years ago when Mark Benioff and Salesforce decided to sell the Salesforces instead of IT people, right? They went around to the end buyer. And so I, think a, I don't think it's a new trend. I think a lot of technology leaders now figure out how to go to the business buyer directly and make their pitch. And interestingly enough, the business buyer, if the IT team doesn't get on board, will do that. I think because the, of cloud computing. And because, and, because of everything. And the modern analog, I think, in our world is that the developers are increasingly in control. Like uh, my friend Martin Casado up in Andreessen talks about this a lot. The traditional model in our industry is you build a product, you launch a, you know, you launch it, you launch a company, you work with the traditional analyst firms, you try to get a little bit of halo, you get customer references, those are the things you do. And you there is a very well structured, for example, enterprise buying playbook. cycle. Yeah. And, and playbook. Playbook and there's yeah. the challenger sale and there's Jeffrey Moore and there's like, you know, so yeah. you've got you know you've got your textbooks yeah. on how it's been done. As everything turns into code, the people who work for with code for a living increasingly yeah. become the front end of your cycle. And if you can get to them, that changes. Like, I mean, think about like, you know, open source, you know, Tom wrote about this actually in The World is Flat. Like, Linux started as Apache, right? It didn't start with the IT department, it started with the developers, and there was yeah. the Linux Foundation, and now Linux is everything. And there's a big enemy called 
the big mini computer not operating systems in the in Wiped in out the whole stations. parts of Boston and, and other parts and of the world, and, right? Yeah. Exactly. That's where I move out here. <laughs> you, follow, <laughs> so, you follow the client <laughs> server out I here. I file the smell of the innovation. No, but this is interesting because the yeah. dislocation of industries is happening. So with that, so they also on the analog, so Martin's at Andreessen, so we'll go, we'll do a little VC yeah. poke here at, uh, at the VCs, because we love them, of course. Uh, they're I being don't dislocated. Poke at any of my the the well, no, the, their playbook. <laughs> yeah. Their playbook is being challenged. So here's an example: yeah. the go big or go home investment thesis yeah. um, seems not to be working. Um, where if you get too much cash on the front end, with an MVP economy we were just riffing on, and with the big superpowers, the Amazons yeah. and the Googles, you can't just go big you, or go home. You're going to be going home more than going big. I, th I think they know that, right? I mean, Dina Sussman, who's I think Chief Informa Investment Officer at NASDAQ, has a very well-known talking line that there are half as many public companies as there were 10 years ago. So the exit scenario for our industry is a little bit different, right? We now have things like aqua hires, right? We have yeah. other models for, for monetization. But I think what the flip side of it is, you know, we're in the- Adapt or die. Adapt, the, yeah. the value will shift, liquidity's changing. I, mean, I, I think the investment community yeah. gets it completely. And they spend a lot more time yeah. with the developer mindset, right? In fact, I think there's been a doubling down focus on technical founders versus business founders for companies for just that reason, because as everything turns the code, you got to hang out with the code community. So um, I think there are You think there'll be more doubling down on technical founders? Yeah, I think okay. because because that is ultimately the shift. There are business model shifts, right? But it's, you know, I mean, like Uber was a business model shift. I mean, yeah, I mean, the technology was the iPhone, yeah. and GPS, yeah. and they wrote an app for it. Yeah. But it was a business model yeah. shift, so it can be a business model And then model scale, shift. and then scale. And then scale, and then all of the, those other yeah. things. But I think if you don't think about developers, if yeah. when you're in our and it's like we build a Lumio because developer could take the product and get started. Yeah. I mean, you can you can add, developers actually can write security policy with our product, and because there's a class of customers, not everyone yeah. where that matters. There's other people where the security team is in charge, where the infrastructure team is in charge. But you know, it, it, I think. Uh, Everything is based on zeros and ones, right? <laughs> and everything is based on code. And if you're not sensitive to how code gets bought, consumed, I mean like, I mean there's a GitHub economy, which is I don't even have to write the code, I'll go look at your code and yeah. maybe use pieces of it, which has always been around. Yeah. So it is, it's, it's, Software disruption is yeah. clear. Cloud computing is scale. Clear. Yep. Uh, Agile is fast and de with de-risking capabilities. But the, the craft is coming back, and uh, and some will argue. We've talked about on the cube before yeah. is that you know the craftsmanship of software is moving to up the stack in every industry. So I, I think it's more like a sports league. So like I love the NBA, right? So in the old days, you were a professional team. You'd scout people in college. Now they used to scout them in high school. Now they're scouting kids in middle school. Who and does that? What it says <laughs> is that you have you to tell. You know, but they can, right? So I think, you know, your point about it, craft, you're going to start tracking developers as they go through their career yeah. and invest and bet on them. Don't reveal our secrets at the cube. We have, yeah. we have scouts everywhere. Be careful <laughs> out there. So, but, but think about that. Imagine, you know, it's like there's such a core focus on hiring from college, right? But yeah. we had an intern from high school yeah. two years ago. We hire freshmen. Okay, so let's go, yeah. let's, I, we, I want to do a whole yeah. segment on this, but I want to just get this yeah. point. Because we're both sports fans and, and we can riff on sports all day long. I'm just not going to talk about the And the greatness on Tom Brady. And Tom Brady's got a sixth finger attached to his hands for his sixth <laughs> ring coming up. Um, no, but this is interesting. Sports is highly data driven. Yep. Okay, so what you're getting at here with an MVP economy, token economics is more of a signal, not yep. yet mainstream, but you can almost go there and think, okay, data driven gives you more accuracy. So if you can bring data driven to the tech world, that's kind of an interesting point. What's your thoughts on that? I, yeah, look, I mean, look, if, I think you have to track everything, right? You have to follow things. And by the way, we have great tools now. By the way, you can track people through LinkedIn. Like, you know, there's all kinds of vehicles to tracking individuals. You track products, you track everything. And, you know, look, you know, we were talking about this before we went on the show, right? Yeah. Uh, people make decisions based on analytics. 
you know, increasingly. Now, the craft part is what's interesting, right? And I'm not the complete expert. I'm, yeah. I, you know, I'm on the business side. I'm not an engineer by training. But look, a lot of people understand yeah. a great developer is better than five bad developers. Yeah. So well, Mark, Mark Andreessen's 10x is a yeah. classic example. Of that. So, so it's it, there's clearly a star system involved. So if I think in middle school or in high school you're going to be a good developer, and I'm going to track your career through college, I'm going to try to figure out how yeah. to attach. Which is why we started. Well, my good friend Dave Giroux. Giroux started a yeah. company that does that. Will fund college education for people that they want to bet on. Sure, they're just taking an option yeah, in there, option right? Option on their earnings, yeah. Yeah, exactly. they, they are. It's it's, like, it sounds like token economics to me. It is, <laughs> it, it, it really, it, you know, you can sell anything. You can see, you, it, we are in that economy. Yeah. You can sell those pieces. Um, the good news is I think it, 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 it can be a great flattener, meaning that it can move things back yeah. more to a meritocracy. Because if I'm tracking people in high school, I'm not worrying whether they're going to go to Stanford or Harvard or Northwestern, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to track their abilities in an mm -hmm. era. And it's interesting, speaking about craft, like, you know, what are internships? They're apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a little bit like a craft, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, yeah. why would I, because you're basically apprenticing somebody for a future payout for them coming to work for you and being skilled. Yeah. Like, because they don't know yeah. anything when they come in work. I shouldn't say that they actually know a lot of things. Alan, great to have you on theCUBE, yeah. as always. Um, um, great to come in and, and get the update. We'll certainly do more of it. I'd like to do a segment on you, on you know, the startup scene and some of the venture capital dynamics. We were tracking that as well. Um, we've been putting a lot of content out there. We believe Silicon Valley is a great place. Yep. There's some issues out there. We've been addressing them, but we really want to point the camera this year at some of the great stuff. So we're looking forward to having you come back in. My final question for you is on a personal one. Um, I love having these conversations because we can look back and also look forward. Yep. And um, you do a lot of mentoring and you're also helping a lot of folks in the industry within just your realm, but also startups and, and peers. What's your advice these days? Because there's a lot of things, we, we just kind of talked a lot of yeah. it. When people come to you for advice and say, Alan, you know, I got a career change, or I'm looking at this new opportunity, or hey, I want to start a company, or I started a company. How do you, how is your, um, your mentoring and your advisory roles going on these days? Can you share things that you're advising, key points that people should be aware of? Well, look, ultimately, it's, I've never really thought about it, you just asked the question. So ultimately, I think it, to me it comes down to own your own fate. Me, and what it means is like, do something that you're really passionate about. Do something that's going to be unique, right? Don't be the 15th in any category. You know, Jack Welch taught us a long time ago that the number one player in a market gets 70% of the economic value. So you really don't want to, you don't want to play for sixth place. It's like what Ricky Bobby said, if you're not first, you're last. <laughs> I mean, you can't always be first, but you should play for that. So, um, you know, I think for a lot of companies now, I think they have to, make sure that, and, and, and people participating, make sure that you're not playing the old playbook. You're not fighting yesterday's battle. You know, uh, Rhett Butler, um, the Gone with the Wind said, there's a lot of money in building up an empire and there's even more money in tearing it down. So there are people who enter markets to basically punish incumbents, take share from, because, because of innovation. But I think the really inspirational is, you know, look forward five years and find a, you know, a practical but aggressive path to being part of that side of history. Um, so are we building up or are we taking down? I mean, it seems to me if I- You're I'm always doing both. The ocean is always fighting the mountain, right? <laughs> I mean, that is, that is the course of, right? And then new mountains come up and you yeah. know, the water goes you know, someplace else. I mean, we are taking down parts of the client server industry. The stack that mm -hmm. you and I you know, built a lot of our yeah. personal career of it, but we're building this new cloud and mobile stack at the same time, and your point is we're building a new currency stack, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to build a new privacy stack. And so it's never, you know, it, it, the greatest thing about our industry yeah. is there's always, a, there's always something to do. How has the, the environment of social media, um, you know, things obviously that we're the cube, yeah. we do our thing with events, and just uh, in general change the growth plans for individuals. If you were, could speak to your 23 year old self right now, knowing what you know. Oh, I have one, one piece of advice I give everybody. Take as much risk as humanly possible in your career earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a lot of people that have worked with me or worked for me over the years. You know, people when they get into their 40s, and they go, I'm thinking about doing a startup. I go, you know, when you got two kids in college and you're trying to fund your 401k, 
working for less cash and more equity may not be the most comfortable conversation yeah. <laughs> in your household. Doesn't work well in my household, yeah. right? I mean, I'm like Benjamin Button. <laughs> I started in big companies, I'm going to smaller companies. Not even, you know, someday it's just going to be me and a dog and one You went the guy. wrong way. Yeah, I went the wrong way <laughs> and I took all the risk later and now I was lucky in part, right? You know, that the transition worked. So when I see younger folks, it's always like, do the riskiest thing humanly possible because the penalty is really small. You have to find a job in a year, yeah. right? But you know, it's, you don't have the mortgage and you don't have the kids to support. And I, you know, so I think people have to build an arc around their careers that's suitable with their risk profile. Like maybe you don't buy into Bitcoin at nineteen thousand. Yeah, could be wrong. Yeah. Could be fifty thousand sometime, but you know it's kind of eleven now. Yeah. Don't go like, all in on nineteen. Maybe take a little bit in there. Yeah, to, you know, to play and run dollar you know, cost you know. averaging. <laughs> well, that's what the fidelity advises. So, <laughs> so I think that's what's really important for people. Um, what about the forty-five-year-old uh, executive out there, male or female? Obviously, mm -hmm. the challenges of ageism. Um, we're an economy, a gig economy, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. MVP economics, token economics. This is a new thing. Uh, your advice to someone who's 45 who just says, hey, you're too old for our little hot startup. Um, what should they do? Well, being on that, the other side of that history, I understand it firsthand. You know, I think that you have an incumbent role in your career to constantly re-educate yourself. So if you show up, whether you're 25, 35, 45, 55, or 65, I hope I'm not working when I'm 75, but yeah. you never know, right? Like, you know, you'll, you'll never stop working, that's my prediction. But, you know, have you, have you mastered the new skills? Have you reinvented yourself along the way? Um, you have a, you know, I feel like I have a responsibility to feed the Cohen household. My favorite part of my LinkedIn profile is a word, obedient worker would be at the Cohen household. Yeah. It's like when I go home, I'm not in charge. Yeah. Right? Um, so I've always felt that it's up to me to make sure I'm not yeah. going to be irrelevant. And that to me is, yeah. you know, that to me is, I don't worry about ageism, I worry about, did I, uh, did I self Relevance. Yeah, did I make myself self-obsolescent? And mm -hmm. I think if you're going to look at your career and you haven't looked at your career in 15 years and you're trying to do something, you may be starting from a deficit. So the question is, what can I do? Can I, you know, before I make that jump, can I get involved? Can I advise some small companies? Could I work part-time mm -hmm. on the weekends and do some things mm -hmm. so that when you finally make that transition, you have something to offer yeah. and you're relevant in the dialogue. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, nobody, nobody, nobody trains you, right? Yeah. I mean, like we don't, we're not good as having a good community, yeah. self-learning, growth mindset, always be relevant. It's not a bad strategy. Yeah, I mean, because 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 you know, I find increasingly I see people of all ages in, in, in companies. I there is ageism, right? There is no doubt, and there's financial ageism, and then there is kind of uh, psychological bias, ageism. Um, but if you keep yourself relevant, and you are the up to speed in your thing, people will beat a path to want to work with yeah. you because there's still yeah. a skill gap. Yeah in our industry. And that's the key. Yeah, the make sure that you're on the right side of that skill gap and you'll always have something to right. offer to people. Yeah. Alan, great to have you come in the studio. Great to see you, thanks for the commentary. This special CUBE comes, we're talking about the future of technology impact of society and a range of topics that are emerging. We're on a pioneering new generational shift and the CUBE is obviously covering the most important story in Silicon Valley from figuring out what fake news is to impact to the humans around the world. And again, we're doing our part to cover it. Alan Cohen, CUBE Conversation, I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.